Good morning. Welcome back to Emmett Grove Baptist Sunday School Hour, and we are in the study of Jesus' miracles uh, in a part two this morning of, of a miracle of the healing of the crippled man at the pool of Bethesda. And uh, we looked at the first nine verses last week, and uh, we want to pick up in verse nine of John chapter five, uh, and looking at those verses through uh, 18 this morning, uh, looking at the opposition. There was a, uh, the last few weeks have been God doing a good work, doing a, a miracle, Jesus' miracle, and then the, uh, the enemy uh, countering uh, uh, and attacking. It's a pattern we see throughout the Bible um, and even then to this day uh, until Jesus comes um, and takes back planet Earth. Uh, and um, uh, it does away with all evil, and that so that battle will will uh, uh, continue until that time comes. So anyway, before we begin this uh, uh, second part of this miracle in John five, we'll uh, go to the Lord in prayer and ask for His blessing that uh, that He would teach it, and not myself. Lord God, I thank you this morning. We love you and we praise you for your miracles. We thank you for the things you're showing us around the miracles. Certainly, you're the all powerful. God, Lord, who created all things, spoke everything into existence, spoke and people were healed, uh, Lord, and, and certainly your power uh, in these things, God, are, are beyond our almost our comprehension, but, but, but that's because you're God, uh, and we're not, uh, and we love you, and we thank you for these things, but Lord, the teachings around it, Lord, have, have highlighted themselves in a sense, God, we thank you for these things, and I pray this morning you would continue to God, speak through me as unworthy as I am. Uh, God, uh, uh, Lord, that you would, uh, God, even speak through me. I just I just feel so, uh, Lord, the word unworthy, God, but I know you love your people that love you. And so, God, I pray today, right now, that you forgive me of my sins, cleanse me, and give me clarity of mind to speak what you would have to be said here this morning in this great miracle of yours, Lord. This is your glory and your honor. In Jesus' name, amen. So, um, Back to the second part, uh, uh, a quick overview of verses one through eight. Um, it was uh, uh, took this miracle took place in Jerusalem, uh, and most more specifically at a uh, place called the Pool of Bethesda. Uh, most likely, it was a bathhouse. Uh, the scriptures tell us that it had five porches. A little description there from John um, it says that Jesus was there. He went up to Jerusalem. Uh, it was one of the feasts there, and most Bible scholars believe it was the Passover. It would have been the sort of, I guess, the second year of Jesus' ministry. I think that's right. There were three Passovers in those three years, um, but he was there. Uh, and he goes and he finds, this is interesting, we mentioned this, sometimes people that were sick would go and try to find Jesus for healing or their parents or friends. Uh, would go find him, but sometimes Jesus would just go and find the sick. He would, and and this is one of those cases where he found this man at the pool, and and he had been sick for thirty eight years. He had been afflicted for thirty eight years. We don't necessarily believe that he was there at the pool for thirty eight years, but this pool was very um, had had a, a, a divine phenomenon that an angel would come and touch the waters, stir up the waters, and. The first person in there would be healed of all their disease, completely healed, and it was this man's only hope. He'd been there, and he and he says, you know, uh, I tried, I tried, I tried, Jesus, and just just before I'd get into the water, be the first one close. He had some really close calls apparently. Someone would step in right before me, and so he was not healed during that time. So Jesus finds him and simply just says in verse 8 and 9, we'll pick up there, read that, and we'll, we'll, we'll pause just a second. He just said, get up, Jesus said to him, pick up your pallet and walk. In verse 9, immediately the man became well, picked up his pallet and began to walk. That's, that's the miracle. Jesus just spoke it, his word, uh, and this man was obedient. He got up. Um, three things. He got up, and uh, the big deal here is carrying your pallet. Uh, he picked up his pallet, and, and, and Jesus said, walk, and he did. Um, and so we just mentioned this, but we'll see this. You just see it all through the Bible. You see it every day in your life. Uh, when God does something good, the enemy always counters. The enemy is Satan, and, and, and those that he uses, even his own demons and people, he uses people and leaders and 
Um, uh, but this epic battle of good and evil, and, and there was never any evil. Evil was not created. It was God that is righteous and holy, and, and it is Satan that perverted good. Uh, and, and, and actually, in a sense, he didn't create anything. He had nothing. He just used what was good and righteous and perverted it and, and, and flipped it around to evil. Um, and and, he, and we just, he does that. And we see it in our society. We see good things God has given us that, that, that man has just messed up. Um, so what you're going to see here is this man is healed uh, that uh, immediately, uh, as, as, as immediately as he was healed, immediately the, uh, the uh, criticism comes, uh, the enemy, uh, on the attacks. Now, there's something that you, we're going to see here this morning, and it was sort of a, it, I didn't really, God didn't really shine this, this light in my eye until really yesterday morning when I was sort of writing the, writing the lesson out after a few days of studying on it. Um, of the things that Satan attacks, the enemy attacks, okay? Uh, and, and we've heard this over and over. I've heard it, I've heard it said many times at church, uh, at Emmett Grove, Pastor Tim, and, and, and through uh, uh, sermons and just commentary and such, uh, and you see it in the Bible. The three things are that, that, that Satan hates, and, and, and it, really, they, they be attacks, but it, it is, hate is the word. The Lord is enough hate in this world, isn't there? Um, first of all, he hates God. Okay, and you're gonna see this. You're gonna see this in verses nine through eighteen. You, we're gonna see a hatred that is for him that is un, that's just unreal. And I, I tell you what, if you're gonna hate anybody, which we don't, uh, don't hate God. That is the worst thing you can. But it's against his his target or his hatred is against God. Secondly, his hatred is against God's word, what God says. Um, and then third, he hates God's people. He hates. He hates us. Uh, I look at even look at Israel and look at look at all of the things that has happened to them, and we even see today a, a increase. This little, this not little possibly this battle, this war over in the Holy Land, uh, which has gone on for a long time. This is nothing unusual. Disputes and fights. I'm not saying loss of life was not important there. It certainly was uh, in Israel and in, in Gaza. Is this this epic battle uh, that, that has, uh, or people have in, in this country that have supported Israel and the first to recognize them as a nation in 1948? All of a sudden, we there's these parades or demonstrations of the hatred of the Jews. What the, the heck is that about? I think if you just ask them, they would even know. They really don't know. We don't know why we don't like them, but we just don't like them. Hatred, uh, God's people, uh, and certainly Jesus Christ. Uh, followers, his disciples, and and which is every believer is a follower of Christ. You must be, or you or you need to check your salvation for sure with God. Nobody else, just one on one with Him. So God, His Word, and His people, and you're going to see that in this script uh, scripture today. Um, and it's just uh, uh, more and more awareness of spiritual warfare. It is it is everywhere. It is it is it is existing as we speak, and it will be to the to till Jesus closes down human history. Um, and it's very interesting because we're picking up these things and the healings we're seeing. Uh, uh, you know, uh, Satan attacking uh, the good works of God, Jesus's miracles. Uh, uh, mainly through the Jews. We'll talk about them in a minute. We mentioned them last week. Um, but uh, how spiritual warfare is playing even into the healing miracles. We hadn't even gotten to the miracles of Jesus casting out demons. That's coming up next. We're about midway through the healing miracles. So you see that even even in, even in um, and we're going to look more closely at that battle, that epic battle of good and evil uh, when we get there. But it's it's just, it's just interesting how already, this is like this going into his second year of ministry and this hostility is, uh, we're gonna read a word here in just a minute. It just, uh, it just kind of floors me at this point uh, how, how it can just spiral out of control, uh, how hatred can be used against God and, uh, and how, he can man how the devil can manipulate people through their spirit uh, to, uh, uh, to, to hate God and hate his people. So let's pick up, uh, we just read eight and nine. Let's pick up this, uh, it's interesting here that uh, what what the, the subject matter here is, is is the Sabbath. A lot of this is, is around, you're going to see this word several times, this, 
this, this uh, day of rest that God gives us because John is going to open up really with the end of verse 9. Uh, and my text in my Bible is split, uh, the healing and then, and then the, the fact that he healed on the Sabbath. So let's pick up at the end of verse uh, 9 uh, where, uh, and read down through 18. Here we go. Uh, now it was the Sabbath on that day. In other words, everything that had happened prior to that, the healing and all of those things was, was, was done on the Sabbath day. And we believe it was Passover. Okay. So the Jews, that's the same Jews we met, that we talked about in verse 1 last week, were saying to the man uh, who was cured, listen to that, they, they knew he was cured, it is the Sabbath and it is not permissible for you to carry your pallet. But he answered, no, he hadn't carried his pallet in 38 years. But he answered them, he, listen to how he answers this. His, his first word is, is really, that's capital He, that's Jesus. Even though he does not know who he is here. He who made me well was the one who said, pick up your pallet and walk. And they asked him, here they are, they're still pecking away. And they asked him, who is the man who said to you, pick up your pallet and walk? But the man who was healed did not know who it was. For Jesus had slipped away while there was a crowd in that place. Now, 14 is a, just a fascinating verse here. Afterwards, now just don't, this is really key right here. Jesus found him in the temple. Those two things. Jesus went and found him, and he was in the temple. So that sets the scene here. And he said to him, Behold, you have become well. Do not sin anymore so that, just listen to this, so that nothing worse happens to you. Wow, man. I said, that's just a, I don't know. I'd like to, I'd like to hear uh, <laughs> more on that verse. The man went away, told the Jews, that's, that's interesting, that it was Jesus who had made him well. Now listen to this. Boy, it just goes downhill. For this reason, the Jews were persecuting Jesus because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. And then Jesus says something else. This is, this is, uh, this is an I am statement right here. There's no I am, but it's, it is all about it. My father is working until now, and I myself am working. Now, look at, listen, it all culminates in verse 18. Listen to this. Not part, really part of this miracle, but we want to pick it up. Because of what he said in 17, he answered what they had been thinking and persecuting in verse 16. It says this. For this reason, therefore, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him because he not only was breaking the Sabbath, but he was also also was excuse me was calling God his own Father, making himself equal with God. And it breaks out at, at verses 19 forward with a discourse. Jesus, I mean, pretty long one here uh, that we'll that we'll see as he explains himself. Uh, we'll close with some thoughts on that in just a minute. So let's look at this attack. Now the first thing that we see here is is in the enemy's attack here, because this is all about the enemy. It, it's about the day. It, it's about attacking God. It's about attacking attacking His word, and certainly attacking this man. We you may not see much persecution in this man, but they really were. They were were attacking him. Um, and we'll kind of look at these things. But but it says here at the end of verse nine it was on the Sabbath. We know that uh, the day of the miracle. And the Jews. These are these were the Jewish leaders. They were not just the just the regular residents of. of of uh, Jerusalem, not just a, just the, the citizens, uh, Israelites there uh, in, in Judea or uh, in, in Jerusalem, but these were those religious leaders and the scribes and those that were uh, almost in a sense hoarding the law and uh, and and it was it was religion with no Holy Spirit uh, and um, they were pawns for Satan. They really were. It's just a shame. Uh, God knew it. It wasn't out of His control, but it, it was all for His glory at the cross. Uh, for that to happen, but it certainly shows us today um, uh, how wicked we can be. Uh, uh, but these religious leaders began their assault. Um, but a note here about, I mean, these these were the people that the, uh, the leaders that, that the, the common people kind of looked up to, like, oh man, it's, you know, we love our pastors and um, and, and sometimes that can get out of hand too. I mean, it really can. You, you, they, they, they'll be almost like they don't. They won't admit it, or they won't really realize it. They're worshiping the pastor and not God. 
You know, oh, we just love him. He speaks so good, and he's just so this and that. But it's not about the preachers. I know it's certainly about the preacher's heart uh, and what he says. But they were looking up to these people. Uh, this this was their 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 um, their, their uh, role model, and and they were pathetic. Uh, they were, I mean, they were evil. This note: some of the worst persecutors of Christ and the Word of God and His followers have been religious persecutors. Um, within the church um, and certainly to say they were a part of the church I do not know I don't think that would be uh, exactly correct but we think about some of these things uh, we had a, a study in, in the in the uh, um, faults and counterfeit gospels and the things that have been distorted and taught to people the Roman Catholic Church is one um, you know that uh, and I think about those days they hoarded the word of God put people to death uh, because they wanted control over the Bible. That's just one of several things. Folks, it, uh, we, they, you could nick, pick uh, Baptist, uh, Methodist, or name any of them. Um, uh, they all have, we all have our issues. We certainly do. Uh, and uh, as it said, some of the most critics of, of the uh, leaders in the church come from the church members. So don't think that we're picking on the Roman Catholics or anybody else. Um, but the enemy within is sitting in the pew. Um, and it's kind of like this is radical Islam, uh, putting to death anybody that mentions Jesus as, as, uh, uh, is, is God. Um, and on and on, even the, even the Protestant apostates that were, that were claiming to be Christian, but yet they were not. Um, and, and, and let's understand this. When we say the enemy within the church, Jesus said he found him in the temple. So this man, uh, we know that the pool of Beth Bethesda was near the temple, near the Sheep Gate, as it was uh, mentioned in the first couple of verses, that he left there the pool. Jesus said, get up, uh, stand up, take your pallet, and walk. And so he walked to the temple. He went to the temple. He's Let's just say he was, uh, in that day, he was in the church. And there it was. He was attacked within the church. So just just gives light to, to what... Who, who Satan attacks? He's gonna he's gonna attack uh, God. He's gonna attack His Word. He's gonna he's gonna attack uh, His people, uh, God's people. Um, so here we have it. Um, so here's their their faulty indictment here, um, in verse ten. It is the Sabbath, they said, and it is not permissible for you to carry your pallet. Um, actually, you know, to be honest with you, there was no law against carrying your pallet. That was that was not at all what it was. Um, what it was meant to be. Um, God established his laws uh, in the Ten Commandments over in Exodus 20 and verses, and it's very lengthy too. He had a lot of explanation there. Some of the commandments were, were, were one small line, uh, very important, uh, but this one was three, uh, three verses uh, concerning the Sabbath about rest. Uh, boy, watch that's a sensitive subject to me. Um, uh, you cannot carry your, your pallet. God didn't do establish this. It was it was to rest. Uh, it was meant to for not work. And here is the key. And we just bring this right into our living room, right into the, today's society. It was for no labor, uh, prohibited any labor for the sake of making profit. That was the key point there in the rest. Um, Exodus 34, 21, Jesus, I mean, excuse me, uh, uh, Moses uh, went on to say what God told him with, with more explanation uh, concerning that prophet uh, about honoring and resting on the Sabbath. In Exodus 34, 21, this is a good one, folks. This is a good one. Um, uh, that he explained that, that the issue rested on the Sabbath and basically with, with no excuse whatsoever, even specifying, listen to this, even during the plowing season and harvest, you must rest. If there was any, any uh, confusion on that rest uh, on the Sabbath, it, it meant work is what it meant. Um, what it didn't mean was acts of mercy. It, it did not mean that. Uh, and Jesus explained that in Matthew 12, 12. Um, he said uh, basically about your sheep and your animals and uh, in helping uh, um, uh, you know, uh, preventing or prohibiting loss of life, animal or, or humans, um, uh, said this, that it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. I mean, it's stated there, Matthew 12, 12, it is lawful to do good, um, but they had added to so much to the law, these Jews, 
I think today, and I look at this, and it's heartbreaking to me to see what goes on on Sundays, uh, but first let's just start with those that, that are not uh, held accountable. You can't shut down law enforcement. Uh, this this is for a protection for for uh, mercy and for for help and healing. You can't shut down fire departments. You can't shut down um, the the emergency responders. You can't shut down hospitals. Uh, the, these are good. It it is lawful to do good. It's lawful to protect and to save life. Uh, it, it, these are these are the exclusions. And those people are working and they're getting paid, but they're but it's for good. You, but we have this. Let me tell you something. We have, just like the Jews did, we have certainly distorted. Uh, they had added, I read where they added 39 laws concerning what you did on the Sabbath, um, even how much you could walk in a day. That's kind of ridiculous if you think about it. But even Jesus would some sometimes uphold this. Uh, um, not that he uh, uh, was for it or favored it, but sometimes he, he kind of went along. Not to say he never sinned, so don't get me wrong here. Uh, well, he he knew how not to how much to go, but they added this stuff. This really was not in any of the sundry laws that God ever gave him. They just I, I think they added some six hundred laws to the to the law. They added. Um, uh, Jesus would say this uh, over in Matthew fifteen one through three about the law, about the traditions of man, things that were added. And then I think about today, I think about the sensitive subject of the Sabbath, and I don't want to, I can really get on my soapbox here because I, I get real legalistic when I start thinking about this. And I was a guilty party in this for years and years and years, and God opened my eyes uh, about this. So the Jews had added to the Sabbath to make it so restrictive in a sense, and, and outside of God's will, it was, uh, uh, and this certainly was for good, was it not, of carrying his pallet. Uh, especially being obedient to Jesus, we'll talk about that in a minute. But we've taken away from it. We 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 we've, we've watered it down. Uh, and we, uh, I, I tell you, the uh, the old ox in the ditch. Uh, that's in Luke uh, fourteen five. Jesus said, "Who who would not who had an ox in the ditch go get it out?" And we will use that as is to justify things that we do on Sunday. Um, we've cl clearly misabused and misused the ox in the ditch uh, and, and, and watered it down. Uh, I, I was, did some research, and I'll be honest with you, I did not even know this until a, maybe a year or two ago in our own country that we had laws called blue laws. Um, I'll tell you, when you look back, I, if we just go back a few years, 50 years, just go back 100 or 50 years, 75 years, and look at what, <clears throat> what <clears throat> our government stood for and <clears throat> and the laws they had uh and then look at it today and it's like who who are you i mean who are we it is so turned around <clears throat> and then there's that gradual we stood we talked about this sunday night how is it that we've almost like gone to sleep and really have remember what god says wake up from your the prophets say wake up from your slumber uh, come to your senses look what what has happened to society but these blue laws, were in, they were actually constitutional laws. Listen to this. It's, and I know, I know some of you older folks probably remember this, but the younger generation would have no idea that it was, that it was unlawful to do certain things uh, and work and activities on Sunday. And the, the Supreme Court upheld it. Uh, and we look today and we see, we see farmers farming on Sundays. We see stores opening all day, every restaurant is open. Uh, you know, we praise God for the Chick Fil A's that won't do it. They're not going to step over that line of trespass, and that's what exactly what we've done. Uh, even to the point now, and it's going to get worse. I don't know what can be worse. We sell liquor on Sundays. Um, uh, you know, even in our in our county, which we we really are blessed to be in, very conservative uh, area of the United States and the state of Georgia. Um, but it's just another uh, uh, another nail in our coffin. It really is, uh, as a country and as a state. Uh, um, and I hate to say this, but it, it, you know, people are, are, uh, treat Sundays like it's just another Saturday. If I can't get it done Saturday, I'll just do it tomorrow. No God, no honor in the Sabbath. We really must visit that in our hearts. Uh, they, the Jews in this case, 
Was that the beginning? Quite possibly. We, we, but we flipped it, remember? They added to it. We took away. We just said, this is you do away with it uh, on the opposite end. So he, his legalism and adding to it can be just as bad as where we are now. So that's my soapbox on, that, on the Sabbath. Rest. Do mercy. Do good. But don't work. And I know some people have to work. If you're a fireman, you have to work. That's not what we're talking about here. If you choose to do it for profit when you don't have to, that's the key here. So we see uh, this false accusation, this, this indictment, for, just for this man carrying his pallet. That's what it was all about. You can't do that. Now, let's look at this, the attack. You may say this is the same thing, but here's an attack on, on the man's obedience. We pick up in verse 11. But he answered them and said, Who made uh, the, he, that is Jesus, capital? <clears throat> he didn't know, but he certainly... Uh, John did as he wrote it. Who, he who made me well was the one who said to me, pick up your pallet and walk. And they asked him, who is this man uh, who said to you, pick up your pallet and walk? I kind of feel, I had a feeling they know who it was. Don't know that. But the man who was healed did not know who it was for Jesus had slipped away while there was a crowd. He just knew when to go and when to stay. And there there was a crowd in that place. Remember, it happened at the pool of Bethesda. Now it has moved into the temple. We'll pick up that in the next verse. But even Satan will attack our obedience. Um, at first, we see that the Jews had no interest in it. There is nothing here that indicates they cared anything about this man's healing. It says here, they were saying to the man who was cured, they evidently had knowledge of what, he, what, what had happened to him. I'm sure in the temple he was telling it. Uh, and it, I mean, who would not? 38 years sick and then he could walk. Even to be able to carry his pallet was, a, was just a sheer miracle. It's certainly for him. Um, but they would have rather seen, this is an evil heart, they would have rather seen people suffer uh, than to be healed, at least on the Sabbath. I mean, that is that you, that's legalist, legalism to, to the max right there. Uh, in another note, that God's laws were never meant for oppression. They never were meant to put people down or to... Uh, to constrict them in any way, but was for their benefit. And in and, and all laws, uh, certainly we, we like to believe in our country, though they are getting less and less or more and more that don't benefit. But that's, that's, uh, that's what the purpose of the law is, to protect and, and, and uh, 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 the liberties and freedoms that we have. Um, so let's look at these three things here about this man that we pick up in these verses. First of all, we pick up his obedience. Now remember, this is all about attacking the man, uh, they're, they're attacking uh, his conduct because of what he was doing, carrying his pallet. Um, uh, so here, here's three things that we learn in these things, in this attack about this man. Uh, uh, the, the Jews were attacking exactly, listen to this, they were attacking exactly what Jesus told him to do. Jesus said in verse 8, get up, pick up your pallet and walk. And immediately the man did. And he walked, and he had apparently walked to the temple. We mentioned that two or three times, but that's where he went. Good place to go. Go, go, praise the Lord. If, if that's what it, we don't have any indication of that, but I think it's there. I really do uh, for this man. Uh, so we see his obedience. He did exactly what the, what Jesus said. They're attacking. That's just what we said. That is attacking God's word. Uh, uh, obedience attacks on obedience. And I'm going to tell you something. You, 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 those that know this, that are aware of the spiritual warfare that goes on. Uh, that if you don't know what it is, just ask God to help you be obedient to his word or just be obedient to his word and watch. Watch the things, that the obstacles that will be thrown in your way. Now, I'm telling you, it is crazy. Uh, uh, and you will be, will be aware. Uh, 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 Paul wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3.12. 3, this is a watershed verse that all who desire to live godly in Christ will be persecuted. doesn't say might be or could be, will be at some time, uh, always. Um, so obedience, they attacked his obedience here to, to Jesus. Number two is his honesty. He says, I don't know who healed me. Who is the man that told you to do this? I don't know. He didn't try to uh, make more of it. He only... Uh, uh, said what he knew. He didn't lie. I didn't add to it. Or, uh, but but he was honest. There's something to this man is special. And it makes me go back to that verse of that question we asked last week. Why this man? This whole place was this pool of Bethesda was full of a multitude of the sick, blind, and lame. And why this one man 
Jesus had a divine appointment with him, obviously, um, but to show these things and, and to help us. But he only said what he knew. He's a very special man here. The more you read into it. And then we see this man's depravity because it says here in verse 13, depravity meaning he did not have the righteousness of God needed to, to, to enter eternally uh, into God's presence and stay there uh, forever, um, that he did not know who he was. He was healed, but he did not know who he was. Very key there, I think. So we see his obedience, we see his honesty, and we also see that he was lost. Uh, it, it, whether he was, I'm sure he was, because Jesus is about to say something, this, this incredible verse in verse 14, uh, <clears throat> that he needed salvation. He needed uh, spiritual healing <clears throat> here. So these patterns of, of things that we see a lost man, and I don't think anymore in verse 14 as we move into that verse, uh, and I really thought God was going to go lead me a different direction in this verse. But this is a verse that is a picture of salvation. Uh, it just, it just, he opened my eyes to this as I was writing this. And this part and this miracle is very, very similar to the one over in John 9 that we're going to study in a couple of weeks. The, the man that was born blind, uh, it's a very, very similar, similar uh, situation in context there of, of a man being healed, then being persecuted. That man in, in, the, the, in chapter 9 was kicked out of the temple. Uh, here we're going to see that Jesus is going to find this man after this conversation, after this indictment of, of, of carrying his pallet. And then, and then who told him, who told you to do that? Who broke the law, basically? Uh, who caused you to, to break the law? There was no law breaking. I think we've already visited that. So we look at this and we think about that. This verse is a picture of salvation. Listen to this. Afterward, afterward, after those things above what we just read, Jesus found him, went after him, found him in the temple. That's cool. Both of those are very, very uh, key uh, uh, points here in this passage and said to him, behold, you have become well. Do not sin anymore. He would say that a lot. Remember, how about the woman that was at... Uh, uh, that they were going to stone. Remember that uh, about picking up the first stone. That, that goes back into the, the laws of the, of Moses back there. Don't sin anymore. Uh, go and don't sin anymore. Told that woman that right. Who who were your accusers? He scribbled in the sand. And they all left, and uh, he said, "Go and don't sin anymore." Um, uh, she was forgiven, and 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 he sent her away. But don't sin anymore. Uh, you're different now. Jesus said the same thing. Do not sin. But listen to what he says here. This boy, this is a, this is a, whew, this make you shudder, so that nothing worse happens to you. Now let's just let's just take verse fourteen, and and I thought that's where we were going to be this morning, and this make sure nothing worse happens to you. Now God's in control of all things uh, uh, here, and certainly that that ought to get our attention. Uh, but they certainly do line up with what Jesus said in Luke nineteen ten. He went and found this man. Um, there, Jesus said, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which is lost. And he certainly is going after this man. This man did not know who healed him. He didn't know who Jesus was. He didn't know. But he went there. There are three things Jesus does here. It says here that we, that we want to kind of bring to the fore, forefront of, of, the, of verse 14. Uh, and it's kind of a, 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 a pivotal verse right here up to that point. Uh, there was a healing. There was an attack. And Jesus said, you know, he asked him, do you want to get well? And he healed him. And then there's this scene in the temple where he where he's attacked and they want to find out the source of the the authority to, to do this. And then Jesus speaks right here. He speaks right here. Uh, and then it sort of just tumbles out of control after this as far as man goes. Um, so there's three things here. Jesus made known to the healed man his sins. Isn't that interesting? You've been, you've been made well supernaturally, and he knew it was a miracle. Um, I promise you that. For that man, we got to know that too. Um, but he, he he made this man's sins known. That's exactly what God does uh, through Jesus Christ and his righteousness that he imputes to us and when we come to know him. Um, and not all sickness is due to sin. I hope we know that. The, the blind man in chapter 9, these, these two... <laughs> well, I tell you, that'd be a good side-by-side -side study right there to take... John 5 and John 9 and, 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 and run them together in a sense and, and look how God operates. Look at his government. Uh, it's kind of a strange way to say it, but that's what it is, how he operates 
uh, how he deals with man. He doesn't change, but we certainly do, and he me- we mess it up, but he never has. Um, uh, but he he uh, all not all sickness is the, is the man born blind. We found out, uh, but for God's glory, was it wasn't uh, any kind of sin that the man was blind here, but in this case it was because he found him. He said, "You've been healed and don't sin anymore." So it certainly was, um, and and he made that known. Um, uh, and the divine warning added to that that really just like we said makes us shudder in a sense that we don't take God's grace lightly, and we do, don't we? Gosh, we sometimes we say, uh, uh, um, uh, trying to think of, uh, 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 I've lost my, I lost my, my, my memory of this. Uh, the, the German pastor, um, I'll think of him in a minute, but he called it cheap grace. There is no cheap grace. It costs God everything, uh, and, and it was not cheap grace. Uh, uh, but, but don't take lightly the things so that nothing worse happens to you. 1 John five sixteen is one of those verses that we could bring in here. I, I don't want to make this part of the, the study, but, it's, but what to, to what much is given, much is required. Uh, what you know and how you benefited from God, but <clears throat> John would explain a death, <clears throat> a sin leading to death. In other words, <clears throat> he's not talking about unbelievers, folks. He's talking about those that, that know God's grace and know his mercy, know his Holy Spirit, that there is certain times that God will certainly take Ananias and Sapphira, the ones that abused the Lord's Supper. I think those were believers, folks, that they Paul said, many of you have fallen asleep for doing these things. There is a death and a sin. God will take you out before any more damage uh, can be done, mainly for to other peoples and a reproach on Jesus. But, but uh, we can't have... Christians running around acting like the world and God won't allow those things and he, he will at certain times take them out. So don't don't take lightly, he says, about your sin. Don't do it anymore. Don't step over that line of trespass so that nothing worse happens to you. Um, you know, we, uh, uh, we if we sin, uh, you know, knowingly and habitually, we're, we're open to God's discipline and chastising. We certainly are. Pastor Tim even said that from, from the pulpit one day this week in one of those three uh, meetings that we had, um, or four. When I, you know, we have three sermons on Sunday. We have Monday night Bible study. We have Wednesday night. But I'll tell you what, there is so much truth being spoken there. It, I, and I love it. it. It really fills my tank, my spiritual tank. I've already said, use this word shudder, but this quote I kind of put together, this should make us shudder and be keenly aware of the spiritual dangers, warnings attending to recovery or any blessing not to abuse it. So Jesus made the man's sins known. He made him made it known of the consequences if he continued to sin. And then secondly, Jesus made himself known. We don't see, we don't see it here. But we certainly know that in verse 15, so the man went away and he told the Jews. That's interesting there too. The man, the picture of being forgiven, Jesus approaching him, healing him, let's call that salvation. He's, he's learning about his sin and, and, and what that means. Um, uh, made himself known, Jesus did, that now he's his savior, whether he was or not. I always think this guy was in a sense. Um, and then three, the man goes. He went away, and he told the Jews it was Jesus. He, uh, this is a this is a picture of telling the gospel. He went and told that, that this is the man Jesus that saved me, that that healed me, the forgiven man. Uh, we see in verse. So another pattern we see here of of uh, of, of Jesus and a picture of salvation. Now let's look at this, uh, and it, this is as worse as it gets. Attack. The Christians attack their conduct. We see that. We know that. Um, well, that's why the Bible says we need to have um, endurance. We have need of endurance in these times to, to deal with persecutions. And um, and people are getting more and more hostile toward God. Uh, and what they would be maybe not say several years ago, now they don't care. Uh, and they will say. And we see these hate crimes that are so evident. Uh, on the TV and in the press, but the worst of all is when they attack God. I'm telling you, this is the this is the woe in the Bible, um, and so we've seen this. So we pick up in verse 16. Let's look at this, and we'll kind of cover this and kind of close this out on this these last verses. For this reason, 
the Jews were persecuting Jesus. They were persecuting God. I wrote down here, attack on God. When, we, when, when the enemy attacks God, remember they hate God. They hate God, they hate his people, hated this man got healed. Uh, they hated his obedience. They hated his conduct. They hate God. I mean, there it is. Uh, but they hate God. They were persecuting Jesus because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. That was it. And then, he, then Jesus adds this. He adds this, and the, uh, verse 17 gives way to 18. 15 gave way to 16. 17 gives way to 18. But he answered them, my father, wow. And I don't know if anybody there got that, but the Jews certainly did. My father is working until now. In other words, he, he is working. And I myself am working. There's so many such scripture, Jesus, especially here in John, uh, that Jesus spoke on that. And it gives way to verse 18. For this reason, another reason, second reason, second attack, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him because he not only was breaking the Sabbath, indictment one, but he also was calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Uh, and that was their second indictment. And I'm telling you, when you indict God, you are in serious, serious trouble. Uh, uh, we, so we see these things for this reason we're persecuting it's persecuting it, it means it was a persecuting is continual it wasn't just one time and forgotten but they were it was a continual uh, persecution of Jesus and hostility even hostile to, to killing him uh, so Jesus responded in 16 my father is working until now and I myself am working uh, and he, this is simply, we mentioned this a while ago in 17, this is like an I am statement. It's basically saying I am God, uh, and he simply says that. Um, I, know I went over to John 14 when uh, the, his last kind of personal time with the disciples, his public ministry had closed down, and this is the night before he was crucified, folks. This is somewhere close into to the late evening, or uh, we're not really sure, but the uh, it's the time that he, uh, uh, on that um, Thursday uh, night, that he uh, turned Passover uh, into the Lord's Supper. And so he's comforting his disciples and his about to leave. John says that his, it was his time to depart earth, to go back to the Father. So in John 14, 10, oh man, John 14, one of my favorite. John 14, 17, the high priestly prayer of Jesus. We'll talk about that in just a second, I think. But in John 14, 10, uh, my favorite verse, John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to me except through the Father. Uh, led to the question, show us the Father. Philip says, show, uh, show us the Father. Um, you know, we, we struggle with, and it is a hard, con took the church, I think, over 300 years to come together, early church, to really confirm in their hearts that God existed in three persons. It's all in the Bible, but just trying to put it all together and we say, why did, you know, and, she, and Jesus really kind of got, a, kind of chastised Philip, you know, uh, in a sense. But at the same time, in the, in the frailty of the human mind, trying to put it all together, uh, I might have said the same thing. I mean, Jesus, show us your father. We want to see your father. Uh, so Jesus' answer to that question was, do you not believe, this is John 14, 10, do you not believe that I am in the Father? Remember, he said, what he, just look at verse 17. That I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. Do you not understand that? Do you not believe it? Question mark. The words that I have that I say to you, I do not speak on my own initiative. I'm not, this is not from, from myself, uh, but from the Father abiding in me that does the work does the work. This is the work. He says, my father is working until now, and I myself am working. What's working is these miracles. This is what I'm doing. I am teaching the gospel, and I am um, explaining God, John 1, 18. I love that verse. Uh, that he came to, he came to, certainly to, to give us uh, uh, salvation and forgiveness of our sins and, and eternal life. Uh, but he came to explain God. He was God, and, and certainly he explained him, but these works, and here they attack, even to the point of, of, of for this reason, seeking all the more to kill him, and from that point on, that's what they were all after, to try to get rid of him. Yeah, that's what they want to do. You know, people that don't even believe in God, they're surely, um, they just don't want him to exist. They just want to, to kill him off, and they're, 
in the Bible or whatever, uh, so they're not accountable. And if there's no God, then I can do whatever I want to with a clear conscience. Interesting about that conscience, you know, you, you can have a clear conscience on even evil things if it's not God trained. I, I didn't really realize that, but but um, but you know, we, we do say things like he did that with no conscience um, because he 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 had he had no Holy Spirit. Uh, uh, the person of the Holy Spirit guiding him. He didn't have a God. They don't have God-trained consciences. We see that. I mean, it's a very apparent. So let's close this out about this verse 17, that he was God. Um, and this plays right into how the Holy Spirit's moving in him. We've been studying on Wednesday night Philippians, and we got to that great passage that called the kenosis passage. I don't want to get over your heads, because if I do, I'll get over my head. And <laughs> what I say. But in that great passage, and I, this, just kind of the light came on again. Uh, several years ago in his passage in Philippians 2, 5 through 11. It said, have this mind which is in Christ. This the Norse, think this. It's about humility. And this passage about Jesus emptying himself, meaning that he left heaven, he left his throne of glory to come to earth and to be born as a baby just like every one of us. And nobody can ever say, ever can say that Jesus does not know what we go through he came and was a man, and he didn't have to be told that. He's omniscient and knows everything, knows all things, but he did. He came, he emptied himself, he gave up some of his divine privileges. And I often think about that, that when he created, and you've heard me say this over and over, that when he created man, he knew he was going to come die. He knew it in advance. And I don't mean the day he created. I mean way, 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 way back in time. Um, there is no number to put on that. He knew that was going to have to happen. It was all in the, the dispensations of God. How, that is how he deals with, with humans, and, 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 but never giving up on us, ever. But he left his glory. He left some of his divine privileges, temporarily setting them aside. John 17, listen to this. We, we studied this under a microscope. But I want to read you this in 17, 5. You know, Jesus praying in this part where he prays for himself. He says this, Now, Father, glorify me together with yourself. He's about to go back to the Father. That's his prayer. And I'm, I'm, I'm about to go to the cross. And, and then I'm going to be res you're going to resurrect me. Uh, and then uh, 40 days later, I'm going to go back and, and, uh, uh, and, and, and come back. And so here it is. With the glory which I had with you before the world was before creation, the glory that I had. He had he had given up that glory. And you might say, what is that? That's that's the face to face to God. Now, those few hours of the cross, this is unscripted, but this is from the Holy Spirit, that when Jesus died and at three o'clock or twelve o'clock that day when he said, Father, why have you forsaken me? There was a separation that had never happened before. But I don't know if we think about the separation that Jesus had in that time, those 30 years or whatever it was, ever how old he was, some say 29, 30 years old, when he was crucified, his age on earth is what I'm trying to say. He left there, he left heaven there to come to earth apart from his father, though his father was in him and he was in the father, there was no separation. But there was a separation for some 40 some odd hours from from the day that he, uh, uh, it, when, the, when the sun re refused to shine and the stars were seen in midday that day and the earthquake and the, the supernatural events, miracles that we won't study here, uh, but those were supernatural events that took place, graves opening up and all those things. That was, the, that was the separation that really, and what was so agonizing to Jesus in the garden, sweating blood from his skin, um, that separation was, uh, was incredible. At the resurrection, he was in a sense reunited with God through through the Holy Spirit in a sense. Not that the Holy Spirit ever left Jesus. I know it's complicated, but what I'm trying to say is why did he do all of that for us? Why would he do all that? Just emptying and giving up some of his divine um, privileges, even the human side of things taking on. He was fully God and fully man. Tim explained that the other night. He was not half and half. He was fully God, fully man. He never stopped being God, as plainly as I can explain it. And he didn't have an independent authority. That's why he kept saying over and over and over, I'm working and my father's working. John, we just read 1410. I do what my father tells me. From, th from the throne, he had authority. Matter of fact, he told us all before he went back. 
that all authority has given, been given to me on heaven and earth and anywhere else, under the earth and above and below and in between, everywhere. He has been given authority and he is today and will until he turns everything over the end of the millennial reign and those wonderful things that we hang our, the nail we hang our hat on, what we really, uh, our hope, that, uh, that, uh, uh, that assurance of things hoped for in the future that are coming. So he was God and he was fully man. Um, and so he says, I am working. And they picked up on it, man. They picked up on it immediately because they sit says, but he was also calling God his own father, making himself equal to God. And we just say amen. But they did not see it. And they uh, attacked that and took that all the way to the cross and hung him there. Um, Jesus would say this. We'll close on a few thoughts uh, about the Sabbath. Because it was all about the Sabbath, all of this hatred, all of this uh, indictment of, of sin and, uh, uh, and all the things we talked about earlier, abusing the Sabbath laws and those things. Uh, in Mark 2, 27, Jesus said this, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. You, it's not made that you can twist it and turn it and, and do it. I think that's very key there. I think it's very key of, of what we talked about, about honoring God on the Sabbath. You know, and that almost has to come from the heart. I tell you, um, and and uh, and I and I just pray for people that don't that, that know they're doing wrong on the Sabbath, and they shouldn't, and they don't have to. Um, and then in Matthew twelve eight, Jesus said this: that the Son of Man, me Jesus Christ, is Lord of the Sabbath. He's Lord of the Sabbath to heal on the Sabbath. It is not unlawful to do good on the Sabbath. I'm just countering the enemy here on things of what was really. It's always about truth and it's always about lies. It really is. That's the good and that's the evil. Part of that clash. Uh, and I just want to say this concerning he is God and he certainly laid it out. And by the way, this, uh, there's a discourse here that runs on in 19 through 30. I'm just going to read this. Therefore, Jesus answered. Here it is. And, uh, continuing on, Jesus answered and was saying to them, truly, truly, one of the truly, truly's here in John. I say to you, the Son of Man can do nothing of himself unless it is something he sees the Father doing. We just mentioned about that uh, independent authority uh, that he had on the throne, that he emptied himself. He sees the Father doing for whatever the Father does, these things the Son also does in a lot. Remember, this is the things that he did on that Sabbath. Uh, and he goes right on to say, even, I love this verse 20, to go on to do greater works, works that you will be amazed. That is raising the dead. Certainly uh, what was coming was his, was his own resurrection and his glorified body. So I just want to say in a thought here as we close of this miracle of, of God doing good, the enemy countering and that, that epic battle, and we're going to see it. And it's going to be right on through many of these miracles of good. Um, that I'm just glad that Jesus doesn't need the Sabbath off. <laughs> The fire department doesn't need off. The law enforcement doesn't need off. And neither does Jesus. And he doesn't have to because he's Lord of the Sabbath. And, and they, that was their, uh, their, their, their trouble here. And oh, Lord, the condemnation, the woes they brought on themselves, these leaders. Uh, there's a song out that I, I love to sing that he never stops working. He never stops. He never stops working. It goes on and on and on. And you begin to listen to that song. And you, you just kind of... Uh, get the, the the omniscience of God and omnipotence of God. He knows what's going on. He's never, I, I pray sometimes, he never blinks. He, he never not hears anything. He's aware of all things, everything, every thought of your heart. He's in control. Man certainly is not. Uh, and it is not God who needs to change. It is us. Uh, so we'll we'll close this, this, this miracle of this healing of this man <clears throat> at the pool of Bethesda. <clears throat> and all of the things who would have ever thought in these 18 verses, we would have so many <clears throat> truths to give and to look at how many, <clears throat> how much hatred there is of God, how much hatred there is of his word, of, of obedience, <clears throat> and hatred of his people. Uh, and we'll see that, it'll carry through. So we'll close on that thought, we'll pray, and we'll, we'll look at next week's lesson. Um, and to give you a little kind of heads up in our miracles. I didn't write it down. Uh, yeah, I can't take on much at a time. I, I get, my wires get crossed. We're going to look at the man with the, with the withered hand next week. Uh, it is in three Gospels. I'll give you Matthews here. Matthew 12, 
uh, verses 9 through 14. Matthew 12, verses 9 through 14. The he healing of the man with the withered hand. Uh, you know, we got a man in our congregation with a withered hand. Y'all y'all know uh, Brother Charles Williams. And, uh, and a man that loves to do things with his hand. Never seen any man like this. I love him to death and his wife. And uh, he has a withered hand. So I don't know what God's going to use with that, but we'll, we'll see. But praise God that he still does miracles. Praise God that he has power and authority over all things, the Sabbath and even all evil and wickedness that goes, and it will not prevail. He wins out every single time, and he's always working. Lord God, we thank you this morning. We love you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for allowing me to speak for you, God. And I pray that those that don't know you will, uh, that like that man, that he did not know who it was that made him uh, well. Uh, but Jesus, you are him. And I pray that those that don't know would come to know you as Savior, would know their sin, God, and know that stepping over that line, God, uh, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a stern warning there for us. Holy God, that we just ask, we pray for salvation and we pray for obedience to your word and we give you thank you, give thanks for all good things you do. In Jesus' name we pray these things, amen and amen.